Um, welcome, everyone. I would like to introduce Elizabeth Hoffman. She is from Emporia State University, and she is here to talk about their MLS program. Well, good morning. Uh, as Megan said, I'm Elizabeth Hoffman and I'm from Emporia State University. I'm an academic advisor. I work with students to help plan their program as they go through. Uh, we try to meet regularly with our students to help them get the most out of their education while they're in the ESU program and afterward. I like to meet with our alumni too and help support them as they continue through. So, in the last 18 months, we have all faced a lot of change and we have learned to adapt and are moving forward. Uh, at Emporia State, we have had some big changes with our program in that time. Previously, we were a hybrid program where students would come to class for weekend intensives twice a semester for each of their core courses. So up to four times a semester, they would come to class on Friday and Saturday in person. We had cohort locations throughout the Western half of the United States in Kansas, South Dakota, Colorado, Idaho, Oregon, Las Vegas. Uh, so lots of different places. When the pandemic started, we could no longer meet in person and we switched to holding our class weekends through Zoom. And as a result, we found that we were able to reach people in a, in a whole new way and decided to reevaluate our program. So what I'm going to talk to you today is about changes that have happened in the last 18 months with Emporia State University's School of Library and Information Management. I'm going to share my slides with you now. There we go. So as I said, I'm from Emporia State University. ESU is probably what I'll call it from now on. The School of Library and Information Management, which is a mouthful, and I tend to refer to it as SLIM. This guy over here, this is Corky the Hornet. He's our mascot. Has been since I think the 30s. Is, he's, it's the same picture. So he's a pretty cute hornet, not very intimidating. There are some other acronyms I'm going to be using, and I just want to make sure everyone is aware what they mean. I know that many of you do know what the American Library Association is, and when you hear ALA, you know that, but I just want to make sure that we all have that knowledge. And then an MLS is a Master of Library Science. There are some other degrees that mean similar things, um, Masters of Library and Information Science, a Masters of Science in Library Science, uh, I've seen some Masters of Art programs that are library science. What's really important is that they are accredited by the American Library Association and they all meet the standards that they set. That is the required credential for many professional level librarian positions. So, as I said, we have reevaluated our program recently and made some big changes, but we've, we've made changes and grown as a program throughout the years. We have had a library science program at Emporia State University since 1902. And this is actually Gertrude Buck here on the left-hand side of the screen. She is teaching storytelling. And I like to look at this picture and then also our Colorado cohort as they were meeting for class in a hybrid weekend. I think you can guess which picture is the Colorado cohort. They're the ones with the backpacks because they decided to hike in for class that weekend and instead meet sitting on the ground. Uh, so I think it's really interesting to see Gertrude teaching class with her students spread out in front of her. And the Colorado cohort learning in much the same way. So in a lot of ways, similarities between the classes taking place in 1902 and the classes taking place in the early 2000s. Uh, the same is true of that top and bottom picture on the right hand side. The top picture is from the 1970s and the bottom picture, this is my, uh, my group of students that I advise in South Dakota that graduated in 2019. So it's really interesting to see they're all kind of posed the same way. Uh, it, 
it looks like a classroom setting. Now in 2019, the only person wearing a tie is the faculty who was teaching that weekend, that's Dr. Wittersham. Uh, whereas it looks like a lot of the students were wearing ties in 1972 when that picture was taken. So as I said, people who care about libraries have always been around and there are a lot of similarities as to the way we teach library science but there's a lot of differences too and one thing that always comes up is the technology and the changes in technology that have taken place throughout the history of libraries uh, in 1971 we taught our students high-tech systems like card catalogs and how to set those up to be most efficient to serve their patrons uh, in 2000, our students were meeting through Telnet. I don't know if the rest of you remember Telnet, but I definitely do. We thought it was so neat that you could conference with people in a completely different place using these specially designed uh, systems with televisions and video cameras. And now, now today, we all have that capability through Zoom or Teams or Skype, many other kinds of video conferencing software. And so since March of 2020, our classes have been meeting through Zoom. And this is a picture of Dr. Dow's class. And I think they had just wrapped up some presentations and everyone is applauding in that picture. So there have been a lot of changes in that way, but we're still providing high quality education. And we have moved, as I said, from being hybrid where the students were meeting in person to meeting through Zoom. And that has been a change, but less of a change than we expected. We're still able to offer small groups. We do a lot of flipped classrooms, a lot of presentations. Dr. Dow's class, like I said, was applauding each other as they were supporting their classmates in their presentations. And we really do try to offer a very supportive experience for our students and a lot of interaction. We want you to learn from each other. We keep our class sizes really small at about 35 student, 30, 30 to 35 students per class. So it's a smaller class size, making it a better group for a discussion. Now, there were other major changes that took place in 2020 with the SLIM program. And one of them was a result of us reevaluating our SLIM value statements. There was a lot that happened in 2020 and it made us think about what we were saying to the public was important to us. And we wanted to make sure that the value statements we had and we were encouraging our students to use throughout the, the program, best reflected what was being taught in our curriculum and the values of our faculty and staff at Emporia State. I was able to be a part of the values committee as we reevaluated and made those changes. And we, we started by looking at our former values statements. Our former value statements were broken down into four areas. And as students worked through the program, they, they met these values. And in their final semester, during their capstone project, they demonstrated how they had met these values. We also have program outcomes that they, they demonstrate how they meet those as well during the capstone. So our first one is service. And service is very important in libraries, but when we read through the statement, all of us on the committee noticed that it refers to client-centered services. And we weren't really sure what client-centered services was intended to mean. It really seems like it was targeted at the people who are physically in the building. And we felt that there's more to a library than the physical building and the individuals who walk through the doors. There's a whole community out there and we should be making an effort to reaching those people as well. Uh, leadership is still an important thing in libraries, but we wanted to make sure that we were clear in what our goals for leaders were as they completed the library science program. 
Ethics are important. We referred to this one as integrity before, before but ethics are important. And uh, we wanted to keep something about that in our new value statement. The last one, mentorship, was actually probably one of the most confusing for our students and really for our faculty as well as they were trying to develop curriculum to meet that requirement. Uh, the, the statement here is to guide and teach current and future clients and information professionals. As I said, that client word became kind of tricky because we weren't sure what exactly was meant by future clients. So we decided to reevaluate that whole statement and clarify there. So we did what librarians do and we did our research. We looked at value statements from other organizations, from partner organizations, from other library schools. And then we decided to reach out a little bit further and we looked into the medical profession and the technology profession to see what values were important in those fields as well. We brought all that information together. We had some wonderful conversations about what it was that we wanted our students to leave the program with, and we formulated our new statements. These are the new slim professional values, and our goal in the program is to make sure that our students leave with these values, as well as the program outcomes outlined by the American Library Association. So the first one, we value the skills necessary to cultivate and sustain collections and services that elevate previously hidden voices and represent the communities we serve. As I said before, communities were very important to us. In libraries, collections and services are very important. It's not just about the books, but it's about the way that we present materials to people, the way that we reach out to our communities. We value and advocate for an inclusive workforce that practices and employs professional values, or professional ethics. Ethics is still a very important part of librarianship for all of us at SLIM, and we wanted to make sure to include that statement. We value upholding social justice responsibilities and making information equitably accessible to advance knowledge and transform communities. That one's probably the hardest one for me to read aloud because that equitably accessible phrase is a little bit hard for me to wrap my tongue around, but it's so worthwhile to have in there because it was important that we make sure that everything is equitable, that we're reaching people where they are and providing them with what they need. And we wanted to ensure that our students are learning how to do that. It's not just about being equal. It's not making sure everybody has access to the books, but it's making sure that they know what books are out there and how do we reach our communities. So we made a lot of changes, but there are some things that are still the same with the SLIM program. And this slide is actually very, very similar to the slide that I had uh, in our informational sessions three years ago because we are still a flexible and convenient program. Previously, our classes met on Fridays and Saturdays and students would come in person to those. We're still meeting for weekend intensives, but instead we're using Zoom so that students can join us from anywhere. Uh, when we moved to that fully online format, we had some students who relocated to other areas because they now had the flexibility to do that, which was great for them and for us, it brought in new ways for us to reach people in different areas. So, but many of our, the things have stayed the same. Our course rotation is very similar. It's still 36 credit hours. We have 22 credit hours that are considered core courses. Of those six have those weekend intensives. One is a technology course. And one is that capstone that I was talking about where students demonstrate the ways that they met the requirements throughout the program. And that's a one credit course that they do during their final semester. We offer a wide range of electives and we have continued to add new electives each semester. Uh, some of our popular classes that are newer that have come about in the last couple of years, Empathetic Librarianship has been very popular. Uh, our grant writing courses are very popular right now, but we still offer some of the, the classic courses that many of us took when we 
pursued our MLS maybe 20 years ago, uh, cataloging, youth services courses, all of those are still available. Uh, electives, there are 14 credit hours of those that students pursue, and you can choose to make those more targeted by going with a concentration or general and work with your advisor to pick and choose the classes that are going to best meet your needs. We have concentrations in archive studies, health information, that's a new one. It just started uh, about two years ago. Informatics, leadership. We offer school library licensure for the states of Kansas and South Dakota. Each state is different. So we do need to talk with you if that's something you're going to pursue for another state and youth services. You can complete your degree in as little as 18 months, or you can take up to seven years as you work your way through. Most of our students are working full time, either in libraries or in another field as they go through the program. So we have set it up in a way that you can complete the program in two years if you're working full time. I would say that the majority of our students go through the program that way and they do graduate within two years. Uh, when they do that, they take two credit, uh, two classes a semester and we do go through the summer. So it's fall, spring and summer. We have students who start uh, in the fall and we have students who start in the spring. Either works, we do uh, rolling admissions. So you can apply right now for either the spring semester that is coming up or for the fall semester a little bit later. We do have some dual degrees available. And since we have moved to the fully online format, we do have two that are online dual degrees. People who are working in academic libraries frequently like this option because you can share some of your credits between the, the two programs. So our history and English degrees are available fully online, like our Masters of Library Science. We also offer a dual degree in music. You would need to attend on the campus for the music portion of that degree and in business administration. And the same is true there. So one thing that Emporia State University has, that has done very, very well is encouraged high impact learning experiences for our students. And we have a pretty wide range of, of learning experiences for them. We strongly encourage all of our students to be active members in the library association in their state and other library associations that target their interests. We send students to conferences. We offer scholarships to make that accessible for them. Uh, on the top, there's a group of students at ACRL. I believe that was the last time ACRL was in person. And we look forward to being able to send people back to in-person conferences when that's available to do. We offer some scholarships to make that possible. This was actually a guided class where students could register for a class, work together to plan out their conference experience. And then there was some coursework afterward where they discussed current issues in libraries that they learned about during the ACRL conference. We encourage our students to do independent research and independent study courses, as well as practicums, if that's something they're interested in doing. They're not required, they're optional, but we do like to support them in that. On the bottom screen here, this is Daniel. He's a former uh, graduate assistant at Emporia State. And he presented his poster on in, an instructional mobile app at the Kansas Library Association. And we we love to see our students doing posters based on the research they're doing in class. It's really important to make that research available to others. On the far left hand side, that's Dr. Fay and his class in 2019, which is the last time we sent a group of students to Germany uh, before the pandemic struck. We like to do these international trips with students so they have an opportunity to learn about librarianship in other parts of the world. This group of students went to Germany and they studied archives and libraries throughout the area. Uh, Dr. Fay has connections there and was able to introduce them to librarians. They were able to discuss differences and similarities between our, our areas. We also sent a student, a group of students to Serbia the same year uh, so that they could learn more about public libraries in Serbia and children's services in particular. 
Last year, we weren't able to have the class take place in person. So Dr. Faye and Dr. Smith got together and created a virtual version of this where students were able to sit down and have discussions with librarians from throughout the world in their global experiences course. But we do look forward to offering these trip courses again when we are able to travel, travel internationally. But as I said, we have moved to a fully online program and there's Dr. Dow's class again with their presentations. And that's an important part of our program. We want to make sure that our students are ready to, to take on leadership roles in their libraries. And part of that is being able to put together effective research and present it to others. So we do a lot of that in our weekend courses with those flipped models. So an important question I frequently get is how do you apply and what all is included in the application process from Emporia State University? Students start with a graduate study application. It's a fairly basic form that you fill out. We no longer require a GRE. Instead, we have replaced that with an advising interview. Once you've completed all of the other steps of your application process, we schedule a meeting and we discuss your goals. You sit down with one of our academic advisors through Zoom now and discuss what your goals are and how we can best help you meet those. We want to make sure that we're advising you to take courses as they come up that will help benefit you in the long run. And we also want to make sure that you're ready for this program and that it's a good fit for you as an individual. We have, we ask for official transcripts. We require all of your undergraduate transcripts, but if you'd like to transfer in credit that you've taken recently within about the last five years, we will accept up to nine graduate level credits of transfer work. And so if you'd like to transfer those, you can certainly include those transcripts. Or if you'd like to have them included in your GPA, you can have those on your application as well. We ask for two letters of reference. Those are going to be professional or academic references, not personal. Uh, so if you've done some volunteer work, I've had students who are coming from other professions ask if they can have a supervisor submit a reference. And yes, of course you can have someone like that if you're not currently working in a library. We're happy to see those as well. We ask for a current resume or CV. This is again, part of that advising process. The reason we ask for that is to get an idea of what your background is. It's not anything that's going to disqualify you from the program. We just want to know if you have a lot of experience in libraries or if you are new to the field. And if you are new to the field, do you have experience in other areas that are going to benefit you in libraries like customer service or management, anything like that? We, we like to make sure that we're, we're doing the best job we can as advisors. We ask for a statement of objectives, and that is that is a statement of why you want to be a librarian, but not why I love books, which most of us who work in the field do love books. You, you can tell that I really love comic books over here, but uh, it's a statement of what it is about libraries that's drawing you. Maybe you're really interested in technical services and making materials more accessible to your customers. Maybe you're interested in public service, working on the front side of the desk, meeting with people regularly. Maybe you really love outreach and you want to be out in the community promoting the library or advocacy, youth services, whatever area of librarianship that's really drawing you right now, that's what we'd like to hear about. That may change as you go through the program and as you learn more about what's available in libraries, but we're really trying to, again, narrow down your focus because we do offer so many electives and to give us as advisors more information as we help you through. Uh, there's an ID verification form that's required for all online students. That's really just a short form where you prove that you're really a person. And our spring application deadline is going to be December 1st this year. So students can apply and go through this process as long as you get your graduate studies application, that first part in by December 1st, the rest of it can be completed later. But we do need that in if you're interested in starting this spring. Our spring semester starts in late January. 
And that's what I had to share with you about some of those big changes that have been happening at Emporia State University. It's been an interesting year and I'm very happy to see some of the developments that we've made as a program. And I am available to answer any questions anyone has, or if you'd like to hear more about any of the electives that we offer. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat um, through Zoom or Hula. Okay. Well, I know that uh, frequently people ask about those graduate transfer credits. So I may just clarify a little bit on that. Uh, like I said, we can take up to nine transfer credits. They don't need to be from a library science program. And in the case of the students that I advise here in South Dakota with me, they, they can take classes through a local university uh, in education and transfer those in, or our state library actually offers some graduate level coursework that they can take in library science and then transfer that in as well. So those are great ways to reduce your tuition rate. Uh, our total program costs about 19,000 for the two year program. However, that's before financial aid or scholarships or any of those things like taking a class through another university to reduce that tuition rate. If you don't have any questions for me, that's what I had to talk about today. And thank you for, for watching this. Well, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, and if you want, um, I would be um, more than happy to share this on our YouTube page as well. So um, it has more exposure about your program for people that are, um, you know, we have a lot of library workers in the state that don't have their M MLS yet. Um, so that way, um, those that didn't attend the conference, they can um, check it out on our YouTube page. That would be great. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> All right.